Welcome back to the Alts Podcast. I'm your host, Horatio Ruiz. We bring you industry leaders and creators to give their insights on the rapidly changing and exciting world of alternative assets. Opinions expressed on this podcast by the host and podcast guests are for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Podcast hosts and guests may maintain positions in the offerings discussed in this podcast. Our guest today is Ali Moise. He is the co-founder and CEO of Stonks. Stonks is an online platform that allows founders to pitch their companies to hundreds of accredited investors and venture capital funds at the same time. Or as they put it, imagine if Twitch, AngelList, and Shark Tank had a baby. We get into all sorts of topics, including his previous company, Streamlabs, which was acquired by Logitech, what makes Stonks unique, and the huge upside of startup investment as an asset class. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ali. We are very excited today to have Ali. He is the co-founder and CEO of Stonks. Ali, thank you for taking some time uh, with us today. Yeah, glad to be here, Horatio. Thanks for having me. Ali, there's such a a history that you have. There are so many stories that you can tell. I kind of wanted to start kind of with a general overview. And it's something that, you know, if if you'll forgive me, like I'm on Twitter and there's all these venture capitalists and angel investors. And I'm like, what the heck is a venture capitalist? And how do you become one, right? So I'm wondering if, if, if you can answer that kind of broad question. How do you get to become a venture capitalist? And exactly what is that? What does that entail? Sure, sure. So the term, uh, by the way, you know, I love, I love this community. Alternative investing is actually one of the highest f- forms of ROI least talked about. And if you look at the portfolio mix of like the ultra rich, the billionaires, they have a much higher proportion of their portfolio in arts versus traditional stocks and bonds. So I love what you guys are doing. And I think educating and talking about this stuff is is like a great, great thing to do for the community. So absolutely a fan. Love it. Venture capital, you know, to your, to your question, the term really is, you know, you could call uh, it, it really comes from last century where early investing in technology companies started, right? With Fairchild Semiconductor in the 50s or HP and it. Uh, that era where some of these technology projects were just too crazy for a bank to fund, right? They were just too out there. There was no operating history. There were no profits or revenues. And that's because with technology companies, a lot of the earnings happen in years five through 15. They don't happen in the first five years of their life cycle. So traditional forms of capital like banks, JP Morgan, you know, Wells Fargo, they're not going to be able to fund these guys. There's nothing to collateralize. There's no loans they can provide. So so that's where venture capital came in. It was just basically a bunch of financiers, crazy people, rich people who said, you know, well, we think this looks like a good idea. This is a group or team or technology we want to bet on. And uh, they did. And that worked. The returns worked. And other people started doing it. And that turned into an industry. And that's venture capital. So I would imagine that to become a venture capitalist, like you said, the the returns on, on your investment, you have to wait for those. I imagine that you would have to, number one, be patient. And that the second thing is you got to have some pretty deep you know, capital or some liquidity there to where you're okay not seeing a return for anywhere between five and 15 years. Are these usually firms that are being set up, uh, companies, or could you just be an individual who's a venture capitalist? Yeah, there's lots of different ways to engage. Funds are typically what, you know, when you refer to venture capital, it's typically like a fund being set up and then people can invest into the fund and then there's a fund manager or a firm that's the name on the door and you know they're they're going after a certain investment strategy maybe they're investing in software saas businesses semiconductors deep tech science crypto you know fintech whatever whatever the specialization is uh, or strategy is uh, the other way to get involved is individuals can do it as well right they can write checks directly into startups and technology companies and that's what we call angel investing it's essentially the same thing but when individuals do it we call it angel investing and when funds do it you know we call them vcs or or venture capitalists and so then you're definitely filling a need in the market because like you mentioned the traditional banking system is not gonna fill in that gap for people that or entrepreneurs that have this great idea but that it's just you have to wait. And I know you I know you're a big fan of that. Like you're a big fan of seeing people wait it out, of being able to build something because something I imagine something that's of quality takes time. Yeah, you know, there's this fun, uh, really fun 
study, I think this was Fidelity that did it. They looked over their like, you know, 100 years of operating history or whatever. And they said, you know, who has had the best returns? What group of people have had the best market beating or at least market equaling returns over many, many, many decades? And you know the answer they came up with? They were dead people. <laughs> people who had died and that nothing changed in the account because they were dead, right? The next best category of people with the best returns over time, over like 50 years, were people who forgot they had a Fidelity account and never changed it, never touched it. <laughs> Isn't that insane? So you said they never even rebalanced it. They never did anything. And uh, it's funny, but uh, what that goes to show is often investors, we are our own worst enemy. We panic sell during times of crashes. You know, we're going through one now where, where there's a correction happening in the stock market, particularly in growth stocks and technology stocks. And so people panic sell. They, they sell at the worst time and they buy at the worst time, right? And when you think about investing in startups, the typical holding period is something like seven to 10 years, right? And what I like about it is it actually forces you to hold on to your investment for that long because there is no liquidity. And it protects you from sort of your own worst instincts as an investor, which is, oh my God, the sky is falling. I'm going to sell, 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 sell everything, you know, like, but you can't, right? And so it, it locks you in and your IRR can keep compounding without you interfering. So I think it's actually a feature, not a bug. Yeah. You know, couldn't say it any better, I guess, I guess if, if you're kind of introducing someone to the industry or introducing something to, to what a venture capitalist does and how they're able to stay the course. But it also takes a different mindset, or or maybe you need that mindset to even begin becoming a, a venture capitalist, right? Yes, I think that's certainly part of it. You you also need you know to have some expertise in what you're investing in, right? Like you wouldn't become a real estate investor if you didn't know anything about real estate. You wouldn't be investing in art or wine or you know any any form of any any kind of asset, even equities, if you didn't feel like you knew enough about it. You were sort of an expert or domain expert. So the same thing applies here. Venture capital is often about investing in outliers in technology companies and technology is a very broad term right it includes like deep science stuff like energy pure sort of biology chemistry uh, but also just simple things like software tools that make people's lives easier you know that run on a simple revenue model and everything in the middle and so when we you know when we talk about technology and venture capital it's really it, it is fairly broad, but you do need to be a domain expert to get in. You also need differentiated deal flow, right? You, you need to have access to the people, the groups that are starting these companies that you're going to be able to get to them before others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just thinking about all the knowledge and all the networking that goes into it. So interesting. And part of that is, is the story that I want to, to, to have with you today. You have such, a, such an interesting background. I learned, you know, that you decided to take a chance. And if you don't mind talking about how you kind of built your way up, you know, you've sold several companies and now you're at Stonks, you, you co-founded Stonks. Could you take me back to that first uh, big success that you had uh, when you were in college, you were offered this opportunity to move out West and, and you took it. Could you take us back there and, and all these decisions you've made to get to where you are now? Yeah. You know, I guess I loved tinkering from an early age, you know, in, in, in like first grade at school, I, I, I made stickers and, cut them and drew them and I sold them to kids at school for lunch money. And in second grade, I bought Pokemon cards and traded them at school. And eventually I figured buying them at wholesale, selling at retail was a better business than trying to trade them. So I've been in startups almost 20 years, have had um, two notable exits. Um, first one was a company called Peanut Labs. Grew up in the social networking space and then um, turned into sort of a, a tool for uh, gaming companies and social gaming to sort of monetize their users using virtual points was acquired by a company called Dynada. The second one was a company called Streamlabs. We raised capital from Sequoia and others and uh, eventually got acquired by Logitech for, for about $150 million. And Streamlabs built tools for uh, live streamers on Twitch and, and YouTube Live. Right, We were one of the world's largest sort of uh, independent <laughs> tool providers for, for that space. So kind of like in Adobe for live streaming. And um, that was the most recent one. How did you fall into that? You obviously saw a need for live streamers, for content creators to use like the, the suite of tools, right? For what they're creating. Like, how did you see that there was a need for that? 
you know, we've written a couple of blog posts about this. I think Streamlabs went through something like 30 different iterations of trial and failure, sort of test and fail, test and fail, test and fail. And uh, the key lesson was to not give up while you're going through that. Uh, because it's very, very easy to give up after your first idea or your second or third idea fails, right? It's very easy to give up because think about, you know, what happens when you go through a startup, you are not doing a job, you're giving up income, right? So you're saying, okay, I, I have to, something I'm going to work on, super excited. You pump yourself up, you get your team excited, you work on something and it doesn't work. Everyone's like, oh, well, now what do we do, right? It's depressing. It It hurts. It's demotivating. And so it's very easy to give up. Most people do. And often it's the folks who don't give up and uh, uh, keep going that come out the other end, right? So Streamlabs went through a bunch of iterations. I was always a gamer interested in esports, and, and we kind of bumbled into the space by accident. Uh, you know, I put together an esports team that competed in the League of Legends championships. Uh, the first season they had it uh, back in 2013. And that's how we got into the streaming space because all those things were streaming on Twitch. I used to watch StarCraft too, if there are any gamers out there listening. And uh, yeah, the, all, all those things were like streaming on Twitch and, and that's how we got into the streaming tool space. It was very adjacent to the previous iteration of that idea, which was in the esports space. But ultimately, you know, um, we grew with the market. There's a lot of luck and there's a lot of like market timing I think those are really big factors in a startup success because a startup is not like a small business, right? It's it's meant and designed to grow fast. And, you know, you can be great at execution, but, you know, there there is a lot of luck and timing and picking the right market that also plays into it, into this. So we were in the Twitch live streaming space that just absolutely went bonkers from sort of 2013 to, to now. And uh, we we grew with the market. And uh, I think right right around the time we exited and I left Streamlabs had something like 20 million users, 25 million users, uh, most used live streaming tool by all of the live streamers in the space, paid out over 750 million in uh, to content creators and uh, one of the most used live streaming apps on the desktop and, and on mobile. So it was a, a highly successful, it was a highly successful company. You know, the other way, the other way to phrase it, Horatio, is the whole thing you know, the whole thing took like nine years, right? And for five years, we were going nowhere. And then for four years, it just went like from like nothing to, to the moon, right? And that's very typical of a startup journey. So a couple of things there, right? Because you've kind of used that experience now to where you are now. And what I want to talk about, I guess, is at the beginning of that, when you were raising, you're raising money from Sequoia, right? How did that process of raising funds from them, and, and I know you have other big companies invested in, in Streamlabs, how was that process of fundraising there? How did that inform you in terms of you know, what you liked about the process, what you kind of saw that could be better into what you're doing now at Stonks? Yeah, I think, I think this is sort of a good segue as well, is we could talk about investing all day long. But I think in startup sort of angel investing and venture investing, there are a lot of high signal firms and, and people in the space that are thought leaders, have, have really great track records that hundreds of thousands of other investors want to follow into deals because they trust their judgment, they trust their track record, they, they like their thinking, and uh, they've just been, you know, these, these are essentially domain experts, right? So, so Sequoia, A16Z, are probably some of the more well-known ones, but uh, you know, there's there's tons and tons of individuals as well as great firms in the space. You know, Mayfield, GC, Excel, Insight, Matrix, uh, SV Angel, First Fund, Union Square Ventures, Floodgate, Mike Maples, Naval, uh, who founded AngelList. So, so there are lots of lots of great, really high signal people in the space that most investors would just blindly follow into a deal. I know I have as well. I'm, I'm also an active angel investor. And uh, sometimes I've done deals just, just following some of these names into deals without looking at much else. I guess like now that you have, you know, at Stonks and what you guys are doing is you're introducing entrepreneurs in their, you know, uh, seeding and pre-seed uh, rounds. You're introducing them to investors. I guess my 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 question was, and maybe it's not, maybe it's too meta, or I don't, maybe it's not even clear. <laughs> but what you're doing is you're you're kind of taking this big big thing of of raising millions and millions of dollars, 
um, and kind of being able to uh, localize it and, and do it really quickly at Stonks. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm kind of, uh, you know, not getting the, the, the whole picture, um, but it seems like you're really democratizing it and opening it up to where, and you mentioned it, like to get access to a Sequoia or uh, an AG-16, you really got to know some people and got to have some serious connections. That's right. That's right. That's exactly the the part that I think Stonks helps with is startup investing, I think for too long has has been too closed. It is, uh, if you look at it, a market that is entirely based on who you know, warm introductions, and, uh, you know, closed circles, really small closed circles. And, you know, there are some reasons for that. There's, there's trust uh, that comes with that. But, you know, the world we live in today, you know, it doesn't have to be the same way that it was 25 years ago, right? And investors everywhere are clamoring for access. They want access to, to great deal flow. They want access to great investors that they can follow into deals. And uh, so the origin story for, for, for Stonks is uh, really comes from two things. Is is just my background and hobby as as an angel investor. I find it very fulfilling to fund early stage businesses because you you get to actually hear from entrepreneurs, work with them, help them in their journey, whether it's advice or intros or strategy. Um, you can actually help the trajectory of the business versus just buying stock in Facebook or Google, right, or or Amazon. The other reason is because Streamlabs was in the live streaming space, right? And we generated hundreds of millions of dollars for content creators in, in, in the gaming vertical. And that was for shits and giggles. Like it was just for fun. There was no investing. And so one of the questions for me was always like, could these tools that we've developed at Streamlabs that get people to build trust at scale between large groups of strangers be used for other verticals that are more transactional and useful, Right. So the two verticals we looked at were 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 e-commerce and shopping and investing. And uh, live streaming, lo and behold, is already being used for a lot of e-commerce. In China, something like 15% of all of e-commerce is going through live streaming, which which is a crazy, crazy stat. Like, like a home shopping network kind of thing? Uh, it's even better. So it's embedded right into all of the e-commerce apps and sites, right? So you go to like, Alibaba or Tmall or Taobao or Meituan, sort of their equivalent of Amazon, if you will. And on the product page, you will see live streams, somebody right there talking about the thing you care about buying. And you can actually ask them a question. You can see them doing a live product demo. Uh, you can see what everyone else is asking and you can see them talking about related products, right? That just like massively increases conversion rates. So, so shopping was super interesting. Uh, ultimately, I wasn't as interested in it personally as I was in investing because I, I I was doing angel investing myself on the side. But angel investing has some of the same problems, right? Like it access fractured, you know, fragmented markets uh, and lack of trust. And these are things that live streaming solves really, really well. It's a great medium for going deep. It's not a great medium for going wide, if you will, right? That's what we learned at Streamlabs. So we're applying some of those lessons and tools to to investing and with stonks we ate our own dog food you know we started off organizing our own demo day about once a month and uh we started doing these on zoom and you know there was no platform no team we were just doing these events for fun they blew up we were moving millions of dollars from investors to founders through like one hour long zoom once a month right and so it, that was crazy. I'd, I'd never seen numbers like that in my career, right? Like that early with nothing built. And so it really felt like we were onto something. So we decided to productize it. We raised some capital from A16Z, a bunch of great investors in our community. And Stonks has also raised money on Stonks. So we've dog fooded our own product. Uh, it works. And uh, we got some great partners on board. So we have, we have you know, Techstars, 500 Startups, Draper. SOSV, Launch House, some of the world's best, most well-known accelerators and incubators are using Stonks to host their own demo days. And for people new to the audience, you know, what is a demo day? A demo day is essentially a pitch session where multiple startups are pitching for five or 10 minutes or two minutes, you know, each to a, a, a group of hundreds or thousands of investors, right? Think of it like Shark Tank. Everyone's seen the TV show Shark Tank. But um, you've got you've got hundreds of investors. You may have an investor panel, but you've got hundreds of investors watching, ready to invest in whatever they think is interesting. 
and a, a few startups pitching right sort of after each other in, in, in a one or two hour event. Yeah. That's what I'm so fascinated by that demo day. <laughs> and I have so many questions around that. I want to catch something that you said about uh, the format that you're using or the, the media that you're using, the live stream. And you mentioned something about um, it's a good platform for going, you know, deep, not wide. And you're using this live stream to raise funds for founders because you see that it works because you have a true belief in the platform, not because you're trying out something new and cool, but you know, I guess it's, it's sort of like part of your, I don't say thesis, but one of your uh, beliefs is that live streaming really can build that trust quickly. And you really can get to know somebody in a matter of minutes. That's exactly right. Right. Like put it in a different way. If you are going to invest in a private business, you know, would you ever do it without talking to the founders? Mm -hmm. No, right? You typically, if you're investing, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars into into like a private business that you're going to be locked in for many years, you're going to have one, maybe more meetings with, with the people who run the business, right? You're going to dig in, you're going to use the product, you will do some research. You, At the very least, you will talk to the people behind the business on a Zoom call or in person. So, what what we've done is we've basically productized that Zoom call. And instead of doing those one at a time, dozens of times over, you can now as a founder talk to hundreds of investors in a few minutes and have your first meeting at scale. That's amazing. Now, the and the big show is the demo day. Is a demo day. And so then you're building toward this. How often do you have a demo day? Once a month? We do we do stonks events about once a month, but Nine out of ten events on the platform now are actually done by our partners. So we had, you know, we 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 have twelve demo days in the month of Feb. We had four demo days yesterday in one day. So yesterday was uh, five hundred global, uh, you know, tech stars, uh, two of the most well known names in uh, uh, the startup incubator space, along with Y Combinator. Uh, and uh, there's an emerging markets incubator and Draper Startup House based out of Austin. So they just did their demo days yesterday. These, these weren't Stonks events. They were just hosted on Stonks because the platform is really fun. It's cool. It it gets people sort of all the features and tools they need to host a successful demo day, gets information to investors, things like pitch decks, sort of summary, FAQs, uh, all the information on startups in one convenient place. Um, and it gives you analytics before, during, and after. Uh, also gets more people to attend your event. So most of our partners sort of double their attendance just by taking an event from Zoom or YouTube and, and moving it to Stonks. How do you become a company that is able to pitch on your platform or for other you know, partners that use the platform? If you know, you're a startup company, uh, and I know a number of our listeners are, uh, they're founders or they're looking to start their companies, how would they even get into that step where they can have this opportunity to present to hundreds, thousands of people at once. It is extremely competitive. You know, not going to lie. Uh, I think in a given month, we we receive over 500 applications and we're only able to feature like five companies at the Stonks event. That's one That's one way to go. And, you know, you, you can certainly do it. You can go to stonks.com and, and there should be information for startups and where to apply. Uh, also information for investors or partners if you want to host your own event. The other way to do it is to go through any of our other partners. Right. When you go to stonks.com, you'll see like tons and tons, dozens and dozens of events. So you could contact the organizers for any of those events that feel like a good fit for what you are doing and apply through them to pitch at their event. That's also a very popular way. So when you have five out of 500 coming through, needless to say, you've, you've done a lot of vetting there. I imagine you basically picked the five most impressive or the five that you feel the best about. Correct. In that case, we, we do our own vetting. We big deals that we think are, are 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 going to be really interesting. And we can talk about what goes into making things interesting or exciting. But typically, yes, in for our events, we, we pick our own deal flow. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, you have this great company and now they have an opportunity to present. I mean, and you know, you know, the business is good. And you, I know you have your philosophy about investors and something that you, you mentioned previously, not giving up, you know, having that grit, you know, uh, where Streamlabs was going nowhere for for four or five years, and then all of a sudden it took off, but you stuck with it. And I know that's one of the traits that you look for. But what if a presenter bombs, right? And and maybe they just get too nervous, you know, because they have they're they're in front of people and they have a short amount of time to present. 
what happens if maybe it doesn't go as planned? Do you still feel like, hey, you know, you made it on the platform, we chose you, we believe in you? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, no, uh, it it does happen. It's rare. Most founders, you know, practice their pitches. We we do, you know, a rehearsal event usually before as well. So they have a chance to sort of familiarize themselves with the process and the and the format. But it can happen, you know. Anyone can get nerves going up on stage, uh, even if it's for two minutes, and even if it's virtual, right? This is all online, so you you're not physically going somewhere, but it can happen. Uh, and and that's the challenge of being a a, a founder or telling your story. You just have to practice and get good at it because, you know, this this probably isn't the only pitch event or fundraising meeting you're going to do. You're going to do dozens or hundreds more over the course of your startup's life cycle. You're going to be selling your story to employees, prospective employees, prospective customers, not just investors. And again, you know, not every startup on Stonks raises the same amount of money, right? Even with a good pitch. Uh, 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 the process is entirely up to investors, right? What they what they find compelling and interesting. So often, you know, we will have startups that raise several times more than other startups at the same event. So to give you some examples of numbers, I think uh, I'm just thinking about this one event a few months ago where, you know, we had six startups. The lowest startup got maybe, I want to say like 100, 150,000 in funding interest. And the best startup at that same event out of that pool of six startups got, got about $2 million in funding interest. Wow. So that's the spectrum. It can be very swingy. That doesn't mean you're not, you're doing a bad job. It just, you know, their investor tastes and preferences and sort of investing styles and you you do get feedback right you get live feedback on like what people like what people don't like about your business or your pitch so what are some of the traits and i I know that with stonks you like to you like to keep it light you use a lot of humor as well to kind of i don't know keep it entertaining right what are the traits of of a successful pitch and and a, and a startup, but more specifically, like a, a pitch, what, what would make the difference between that $2 million and that $100,000 presentation? I know, I know, and I know there's a lot of variables, and, and you mentioned preferences and taste, but what are some things that you suggest for a founder going in? Look, even our name is, is like not very serious, right? We, we like to keep things light. There's a lot of memes, there's a lot of uh, humor. I think, you know, uh, Elon Musk, I think, said, uh, this is one of my favorite tweets from him is, uh, uh, the most entertaining outcome is the most likely. And I think when you look at something like investing, it can get a little sort of dry, repetitive, you know, lots of deal memos and analysis and financial state, yada, yada. Something something that's exciting, entertaining, often has, has will stand out more in that landscape, right? And so we, we certainly bring that flavor to a lot of what we do. Um, you know, check out our Twitter account, Stonks, dot com uh it you know it'll make you smile every single morning we do a lot of shit posting making fun of the industry in general you know investors and founders what goes into a successful pitch you know from the from the few hundred deals we've done in the last six months uh and and the events the common patterns we see are is there is there a well-known lead investor already in the round right so so this financing round you're putting together you know, who else is in it uh, matters a lot. Investors often rely on other investors they know to be high judgment, high signal to provide direction, right? So if there's if there's like a A16Z or Sequoia or, or like a Naval in the round, that's amazing. Yeah. The other things, you know, the founder's background has this person, he or she has, have, have they had a track record of success? You know, are they domain experts? Are, have they done other startups in the past? You know, what is their origin story? And then obviously things like traction, right? Is is the business actually working? What stage is it at? How do we know it's working? What's the revenue? What's the you know user growth? And then lastly, you know what what market or sector are they in, right? So you know, and that changes. What's hot changes every few years. Currently, fintech and crypto are super super hot and top of mind for most investors, and those those tend to get uh, more more attention than uh, other sectors for for better or for worse. I got a couple more points. Again, I thank you for your time. I really do. What about if I want to become an investor? 
can someone with a couple thousand dollars join one of the demo days or are you or is this more for high high level investors accredited investors that get invited to do angel investing or to put their fund in there for founders a uh, good question i wish everyone could get in i think everyone deserves to be able to invest in startups but uh, you know we we have laws that uh, uh, have been laid out the sec and and other bodies regulate this and so investing in startups is uh, typically only allowed for uh, accredited investors, right? So accredited or qualified purchasers. So larger investors, and I think their, their income requirements or, or net worth requirements. Typically, you have to be making either more than 200K a year or have a net worth of a million dollars or higher to be able to invest in startups. So unfortunately, you know, that's... Uh, that's that's the sort of state of the industry today with some exceptions we'll talk about those i think if you are a startup founder or an early employee at a startup typically you will have appreciated stock in that startup right and you can use that towards the accreditation requirements of net worth even if it's not liquid so what do i mean by that if you're an early employee at like a startup that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars you're doing really well you know your stock is probably on paper worth more than a million dollars if you're a founder almost always worth more than a million dollars on paper as long as the startup has raised some financing and it's been valued at a certain valuation by third-party investors uh so you can you you know you given certain details but you can usually qualify that towards your net worth so that's one way to do it if you don't outright meet the income or net worth requirements, the other way is I think some of the partners listed on uh, on, on your website are crowdfunding platforms, right? So Republic, uh, VFunder, and others uh, do allow retail investors to participate through something called regulation crowdfunding, Reg CF, in in startup deals or small business deals. Uh, so, so, so that is possible through a different law and sort of a different route. The challenge there, I think, is uh, you just have to be a little bit more picky and careful on what sort of uh, you're investing in because, uh, you know, there's a much wider spread of the types of opportunities there that uh, are, are available. So you just have to be a little bit more careful and picky in what you choose. And, and you may not get the same deal flow that some of these top tier venture investors are getting but you do get some good deal flow. When you talk about deal flow, what do you mean by that? Um, the highest quality companies. I think over time this will change, but today the state of the industry is is the highest quality companies generally don't want thousands of people on their cap tables. You know, for simplicity, uh, but also uh, just to make it easier to manage the deal, the fundraising and deal closing process. Uh, they would rather get fewer sort of highly curated strategic people that are typically either within their industry, executives at partners or customers, you know, uh, VCs or, you know, professionals in the space. Uh, but I think that is changing. A lot of folks now see value in getting more and more of, of their community on their cap table who can become customers or brand evangelists for them. So, so that is starting to change. I think in the next few years, you know, this this will more and more high quality sort of tier one startups are going to look at uh, crowdfunding. That's an interesting development, I would say. And I think that, like you said, an, an evangelist, right? You see that in the NFT space, how people are so, you know, rah-rah about their, their project or their community um, and how brands and companies have the potential to do the same. Exactly. And just to clarify, so if you are, if a listener is an accredited investor, Will they have to go through a vetting process through Stonks or Stonks kind of just automatically accepts the accredited investor? For Stonks, you know, you can join, you can self-certify that you are an accredited investor. But when you actually do an investment, before you can wire money, we do have to verify that you are an accredited investor. So, so you have to show us, you know, something that meets either an income or net worth requirement, be it, you know tax returns or your brokerage account, or bank statements or something. And that's typically reviewed by a licensed attorney or, or, or a licensed CPA. Uh, or you can have your own CPA, you know, look at it and issue you a letter saying, yes, I've looked at this person's records, they're accredited. And then you can use that letter, uh, you know, on any platform, including stocks. But I should, you know, I should point out that like we've designed stocks to be very approachable and, and open. So, Anyone can join an event and watch. Most of the events are open to everyone. So oftentimes we'll have other founders come in and watch other founders pitch. 
just so that they can learn how to improve their own pitches and sort of see what else is interesting out there. Well, you know, what's on the cutting edge. Uh, so there, there are many investors, there are many founders who are not accredited, who, who do come to Stonks just to to see the latest and greatest and, and just learn. You know, there's there's a fair amount of learning that has to happen even before you write your first check as an angel investor. So, and you're saying it's open. Is it open to, to the general public even? You know, if, if I'm curious about how one of these events works, I can just uh, go into the website and, and join in on one of the, the demo days? Yeah, some are private, but most of them are open. So you can click around, you can RSVP. Like this is the easiest way to learn is is just go to pick three great events that interest you and just go to a few events and see what other people are pitching and how they're doing it and the questions that investors on a panel or judges are asking, right? It, it's a phenomenal way to learn. It's completely free and uh, it's it's a great way to network and just to like kind of see who's who in the space as well. Uh, and be a part of events that you typically most people wouldn't have had access to. So like by getting all of these partners to host their events on Stonks in, in, in one place, they're easy to discover and they're really easy to participate in. I, I definitely got to join in on one. I, I, I see the, the quick stream on Twitter and it just looks like a lot of fun. And you, everyone looks like they're laughing, presenting and, and getting money raised, you know, getting the job done. I kind of want to leave with one last thing, Ali. And again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. In one of the interviews you mentioned, or one of your podcasts actually, um, you mentioned that that startup investing is sort of an underallocated asset class, right? And then you started mentioning other avenues. What do you mean by that? Like, because when I when I think about startup investing, I don't think of it as an investing class. I, you know, I don't think of it as a yeah as an as an asset class the way I would think of say wine or trading cards. What is the potential for the growth here? I mean, I think I think this is. This is the single greatest asset class of all time. Something like 40% of market cap has, has come from technology companies that were at one point startups. But the amount of funding that has gone in to these companies that represent 40% of the market has been less than 1% of, of the total funding that has been deployed. Wow. Right? So if you if you think about that, like 99% of the funding goes to companies representing, you know, call it half the market. And 1% of the funding is going to companies representing roughly the other half of the market, right? <laughs> Where should you be putting your money? That's your ROI right there. Yeah. So uh, there's this there's this really great um, study that came out. I think this is Cambridge Associates. They looked at a really long-term, like 30 to 40-year time horizon. And uh, they compared the returns for venture capital net of fees to uh, the S and P or you know other other benchmarks and uh, uh, venture capital over like the extremely long run has, has tended to do really well as an asset class. You know it has outperformed the S and P. It has outperformed uh, uh, other benchmarks and indexes, but it is very swingy, right? So you have to hold, hold, hold for a long time, and you have to be willing to sort of hold on to things for ten years until they mature. It sounds like the ideal investment for someone that you know has that. That question, the proverbial question, I ran into some money, I got some money, I inherited some money, what should I do with it, right? You know, and they're usually asking for investment advice. And I guess that would be that that would definitely be one avenue if you point them to those uh, figures. And I guess I would be interested in you guys are doing a doing your part, right? Democratizing it. And I wonder how it could become an alternative asset in the same way that I can invest in a in a moon rock or that I can invest in a Mickey Mantle rookie as just a regular uh, retail investor. How can I get access to that pool? You know, how can I get access to these these tech startups? You know, I, I guess that would be my question. You know, for the industry. You know, there's a bunch of great platforms. I think they're a good place to start. AngelList is uh, the leader in the space, right? Stonks is another great way if you if you want to physically sort of see and hear from the people, ask them questions, live interactive events, and then crowdfunding platforms are another way. You know, we mentioned them earlier: WeFunder, Republic, and others. Start Engine. Platforms are a great way to start. Check them out and, and look at the deal flow. Engage with each platform for a while. Get a sense for the feel and flavor of sort of uh, the deals you see and you know what you'd like to commit to before you write your first check. The other thing I would recommend is don't front load all your money and just do a bunch of deals like quickly, right? Think about it in terms of an annual budget. I have... X amount of money that I would like to deploy in sort of investing add to my portfolio this year. I'm going to take maybe, let's say, call it 40% and allocate that to startups. And the other 60% is going to be stocks and bonds or 
or other alternative assets, crypto or collectibles or, or whatnot, uh, real estate, you know, that's another big one. You know, you take a certain dollar amount and then you break it down by quarter, right? You say this quarter, this is my budget. I have $10,000 this quarter and I'm going to go figure out how to deploy this into startups, you know? So 10,000, you probably want to write 10 $1,000 checks or four $2,500 checks every quarter. Um, and you can do that. You can break your checks down into as little as $1,000 on stonks, right? Super easy. We handle all of the paperwork and all that stuff for you. The other option is is to go through funds, right? Professionals who will charge you fees to do this. Then they will handle the startup sourcing and selection. But typically you need larger check sizes, tens of thousands of dollars at a minimum to kind of get into funds, if not more. But that's how I typically think about getting involved or getting getting started you know in the space startups are some of them will go public right and some of them will get acquired for large sums of money and that's how you eventually get your liquidity and your return as an investor in this asset class we can go on forever and i want to respect your time could you give me one one company um or one success story uh, that stands out to you that's gone through stonks so far or, or that's on a trajectory that you think you know they, that they really benefited from being on your platform yeah, absolutely. I mean, this platform is six months old, so it's hard to have uh, huge success stories when the average holding period is seven to 10 years and the platform is only six months old. But despite that, we've had uh, some startups that have actually been on Stonks more than once, even in six months, because they loved it so much and their business was crushing it. So I'll give you two examples. One is a startup called Loan Base. They've pitched twice on Stonks and both times they've raised more than a million dollars. Their business is growing really well. They're they're democratizing access to commercial real estate loans. You know, think about getting a mortgage on your house, right? Like uh, it used to be so difficult. Now it's a little easier. You can kind of shop different lenders online, right, for different rates and like kind of like get a better deal as 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 a homeowner, potential homeowner, right? That doesn't exist for the commercial lending space. So if you're a commercial real estate investor. You want to buy an apartment building or you want to buy like a, a group of four houses and like reno them and that sort of thing. Loans for that are still like completely manual. You have to go bank by bank, application by application. And uh, so they're they're fixing that space. Since the first time they pitched on Stonks, uh, I think their valuation has gone up uh, significantly. I think something like a, a three to four X, even in the space of less than six months. The other example is, uh, is, is a fintech savings app uh, for India. Uh, fintech and crypto are really popular on Stonks, but this is a fintech app where it allows people in India to save small amounts of money every day, you know, like a few cents in everyday transactions, round it up, and then uh, invest that into gold. Investing in gold and precious metals is like a big part of Asian culture, right? It's really big in, in China and in India. And so this app lets you automatically do that, right? Without like going through all of the steps in the middle. And it's super, super popular. The first time they pitched, you know, on Stonks, I think was like July or August last year, even before we had a website, we were just doing these demo days on Zoom. And since then, six months later, their their numbers have more than 10 x in terms of traction. They're doing hundreds of thousands of transactions, you know, on a, on a weekly basis now. They have uh, millions of millions of users just in the space of six months, right? Like that startup has just been a rocket ship and their valuation has 10 x in in those few months between the time they first pitched on Stonks and, and, and the second time they pitched. So the investors who got in first, you know, their valuation, their markup, their, their money has 10 x in, in like six months. Just so much to think about. Thank you for you know your time, Ali. Thank you for all the advice and the stories and and what you're what you're building at Stonks, and you're just so generous with with it. And I look forward to joining into one of those demo days. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely check it out and because it just looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Happy to help. Look, uh, I think uh, talking about this stuff is super uh, super useful because people deserve to know about these different asset classes. I want to thank Ali for coming on the podcast and giving us an hour of his time with so much industry knowledge and so many insights. And there's so much more we could have talked about. The Stonks platform is truly a step forward in opening up a world of investing opportunities. His bullishness on alternative assets is also encouraging to hear and a good sign that the industry is headed in the right direction. 
As always, if you enjoyed today's podcast, let others know about it. We find our guests so interesting and knowledgeable, and I know others will too. Or leave a review or hit the follow button. Until the next episode, take care.